My grandfather, Nels, came over from Norway. He had three brothers, Uli and Knut and Martin. And those weren't Chinese, I can tell you that for sure. And when Grandpa Nels came over from Norway, he settled in Wisconsin. Uh, they were Lutheran people, as uh, of course most of the people from Norway and Scandinavian countries uh, were or are. And uh, Grandpa was a young man, his new bride, uh, they worked hard, they got a farm going up in northern Wisconsin. And uh, things were going along nicely with uh, horses and cattle, acreage, new house and barn that he'd built. When one day a terrible fire came, you can still read about it in the history of northern Wisconsin. People lost their lives, <clears throat> millions of dollars worth of damage. And in the process, Grandpa Nels found himself with his family and those who were trying to save his farm finally down by the spring. The barn had burned down, all the cattle and horses had burned up, the house had burned down, and they'd lost everything, and they were surrounded by flames that were closing in on them from every direction. And the women and children were there by the spring while the men took water from the spring in buckets and dumped it over blankets that they had over the women and children, trying to save their lives and keep them from suffocating. It didn't look like there was any hope as the fire closed in. And finally they ran out of water, the spring went dry, the men crawled under the blankets with the rest of them and waited to die. Grandpa Nels began to pray. And he prayed and he said, Lord, if you will spare my life and my family, I will do anything you want me to do, go anywhere you want me to go. He made promises. People often do in those kind of circumstances, don't they? Miraculously, the wind changed and the fire did not come all the way into the circle. They crawled out from underneath the blankets and the buckets that had been empty were all filled with water. And they uh, sprayed the blankets one more time and made it through with their lives. Well, they were thankful for that much. And they began to try and piece things together again. And uh, try to carve out a, another niche in northern Wisconsin. But Grandpa Nels began to read his Bible like he never had before. He began to read it right through from Genesis to Revelation. One night he was reading, and he came to Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And he turned to Grandma and he said, uh, Well, which, uh, which day of the week is the seventh day? And she said, Saturday. And what day of the week is Sunday? And she said, the first day of the week. Dummy. <clears throat> or uh, whatever else they might have said in Norwegian. And he said, uh, we've been worshiping on the wrong day. And she said, you're crazy. But he continued to read, and that was enough for Grandpa. Exodus 28 to 11, the very next Saturday, he worshiped God on the seventh day. And his wife thought that he had gone out of his mind. He didn't know there was another person in the whole world who was doing this but it was in his Bible. Well, things went on that way for a while, and I guess Grandma put up with it, but uh, people heard around the farms there. And uh, not long after that, there was a man and his family headed west in their team and wagon, and they came in those parts, and as they 
stopped on Friday afternoon and asked around, they asked if there were any Seventh-day Adventists. And the farmers said, uh, what's that? And they, they said, uh, someone who worships God on the seventh day of the week, on Saturday. Oh, they said, there's a man named Nels Venden who does that. And they got directions, and these people went to Grandpa Nels's yard and drove in just as the sun was setting on Friday evening. And uh, the man got out of his uh, wagon, and he met Grandpa Nels, who had come out to greet him. And he said, is your name Venden? Yes. He said, uh, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? And Grandpa Nels said, what's that? And he said, someone who worships God on the seventh day of the week. And, and Grandpa said, yes. And for the first time, Grandpa met another person in the world. Well, this man and his family were Seventh-day Adventists. And Grandpa invited them to stay that weekend. So they stayed, and that very night they got around the table, and this Adventist family were teaching them some of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Except for Grandma. Grandma was over in the corner, knitting. She had never knit so much in all of her life. But she couldn't help but hear what was going on. And before the weekend was over, Grandma was over studying with them. And that weekend, my Grandma and Grandpa from Norway accepted the Seventh-day Sabbath. Both of them. And that was the beginning as far as my heritage and my family was concerned from simply reading the Bible. Now, they had been Lutherans. And what is a Lutheran? Well, someone who has come down from the great days of the Reformation and Martin Luther. I want to ask you a question tonight. Are you a Catholic, a Protestant, or a Jewish person? Uh, what is your faith? And uh, people today in Protestant America usually say, well, uh, I'm a Protestant, if they are. And if you were to ask them the next question, most people would be stopped dead in their tracks. You're a Protestant? Yes. Uh, what are you protesting? A Protestant is one who is protesting something. That's where the name came from. It came from the protest of the princes in Germany during the Reformation. Did you know what the pro protest of the princes was? But people have no idea what being a Protestant is today. They're supposed to be protesting something. Well, we have heavy truth to talk about tonight. And after this long introduction, I'd like to sing a song. <clears throat> about time to close, I guess. <laughs> and the song is an old one, but it's a good one for tonight. Open mine eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open mine eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. That's a lot of words, but maybe some of you know it. Let's try it. It's beautiful. Open mine eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth thou hast for me Place in my hand the wonderful key That shall unclasp and set me free Silently now I wait for Thee. Ready, my God, Thy will to see. Open mine eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine. The chorus once more with all of the parts like a big choir, please. 
Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God I will to see. Open mine eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. That's a good prayer because song can be prayer and prayer can be song. Now as we talk about a day to remember, last night and tonight. I hope that we can see something that many people have not realized this evening. And that is that uh, although many, many people have known that the seventh day is God's day of worship according to the Bible, there are many, many people who have known that who didn't know how important that was to God. They didn't know how God felt about it. And so some of the kind of thinking that has arisen over the question for years really needs to be double-checked as we study tonight. You know, the idea that it really doesn't make that much difference, uh, one day and seven and all the rest of it. Uh, God is not particular. In our subject tonight, we're going to discover that God is particular and why. So let's begin by turning, first of all, to a passage of Scripture found in Revelation, the seventh chapter, beginning with verse 1. Revelation 7, beginning with verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Have you ever wondered why this world keeps going on when it's a big, giant tinderbox? is all it is. And that really, on the, on the basis of the law of averages, we should have had some foolish statesman walking in his sleep one night push the wrong button already, shouldn't we? How can you explain that this world on the verge of uh, international collapse and blowing itself to bits, how can you explain that we're still here? There are uh, people who have nothing to do at all with religion, statesmen and politicians who are very much aware of the fact that this world is in deep trouble. And when you go into the airport today and you see the signs, you know, no nukes, why, it's on every hand. People are nervous and frightened. Men's hearts are failing them for fear. All you have to do is have some idiot, pardon me for that, push the wrong button, and the whole world goes up in smoke. It is a known fact that in the next war, if we get into a nuclear war, during the first 18 hours, millions of people will die. It won't be a hand-to-hand battle. It'll be a push-button war. We know that. So there must be someone bigger than we are that's holding the winds back. Don't you think so? And this is the prediction, this is the description of it, right here in Revelation, the seventh chapter. The angels are holding back the winds of trouble and strife and war. Until what? Until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, the same kind of language is used in Revelation, the fourteenth chapter, which we've looked at uh, repeatedly already because we've noticed that all of the six pillars of the faith that we've been talking about are found in Revelation, the uh, 14th chapter. And so here again you have the seal and God's name written in the foreheads of his people. Well, this leads us to the question, uh, what is the seal? But before we notice that, let's go to Revelation, the 13th chapter now. 
And notice verses 13 to 17. Revelation 13, verses 13 to 17. Here you have a picture of a world power that if you carefully check it out, is none other than the United States. And we'll begin with one of the interesting symptoms of what this power is in verse 13. He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Has the United States ever been involved in something like that? Yes, you know the story. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and all the rest of it. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. The beast referred to as the first half of Revelation 13, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So on the basis of Bible prophecy, Seventh-day Adventists believe that the United States is going to lead a great world movement before this world ends in a uh, revival of the beast power that preceded it and the threat, the threat of capital punishment if people do not go along. And then it says in verse 16, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Well, this sounds like strange language. But it wouldn't take very much to bring the American people to panic. I've heard people from foreign countries like Germany and England say, what would you Americans do if one bomb dropped in your country? What would you do? Well, I think we have a pretty good idea of what we'd do. And if we ever get into a nuclear holocaust of some sort, what do you suppose would be the first thing that people would shout for. Before we destroy ourselves completely, let's all turn to, to God. You could expect that from politicians and statesmen and religious people everywhere. And if fire ever comes down again on the earth in the sight of men, like happened way back there at the very beginning, and the angels have been holding it back ever since, you know what happens when people get flat on their back. Then they look up and they say, let's turn to God. And with, let's all turn to God in the same way. And there will be martial law and there would be all kinds of attempts to force people to save the world by turning to God. So we can see, if we think carefully at all, how this kind of thing could happen. Now, let's get a little bit of the history of this seal and this mark. Attention tonight is on our foreheads. We've noticed so far that the angels hold the winds until God's people can be sealed in their foreheads. But this beast power has something you can receive in your forehead too. It's not a seal, it's called a mark. And you can receive it either in your right hand or in your forehead. The next question is, what is this power? And what is this seal? And what is this mark? Well, let's review just a moment. We did a little bit on this a week or so ago when we talked about the third angel's message. If you take the two books of Daniel and Revelation, put them together, you have a history of the world starting around 600 B.C. until the end. But in Daniel, we are told that the book was sealed and shut up until the time of the end. Special significance for the time of the end. If that's true, then the books of Daniel and Revelation 
are going to have even more detail as you get toward the end of the world because they are significant for that time. As you go back to the very beginning of the book of Daniel, you have several stories that help keep the kiddies awake. You know, Daniel in the lion's den and the fiery furnace in the first parts of Daniel, and we all love those stories. And then it begins to get into heavier things, like the history of the world in advance. It's called prophecy. And the prophecy clearly indicated 600 years beforehand what was going to happen. Four great world empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome divided into ten kingdoms. The ten kingdoms, three of them fall, and another power takes over and rules the remainder. And that power is the papacy, which ruled for 1260 years, right on down through the Dark Ages. A religious, political power which received its authority from pagan Rome, the last of the world empires. Then you have the papacy, or papal Rome, coming to its end in the year 1798, at the end of 1260 years. And you have the time of the end beginning. The time when the judgment would come, and the end of the world. Well, it's no secret that the first half of Revelation 13 talks about the papacy, or papal Rome. I'm going to read you the ten identifying marks of this power. You put Daniel and Revelation together, and here they are. The papacy gets its authority from pagan Rome. Number two, this beast or this power is a blasphemous power. And blasphemy is defined in the Bible as man claiming the power to forgive sins and man claiming to be God on earth. Number three, this power would have political strength in history, and it certainly did, reigning over the then known world, the civilized world, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Number four, it would make war on God's people. It would be a persecuting power. And anyone who is informed on the Dark Ages knows the truth on that matter. Number five, it would rule for 1260 years according to Bible prophecy, which it did. Number six, it would receive a deadly wound, which it did at the end of that time. But, number seven, the deadly wound would be healed, which it was. And number eight, it has a number, 666. Number nine, it has a mark that people can receive in either their forehead or their right hand. And number 10, according to Daniel 7:25, this power would attempt to change God's law, that part of God's law that has to do with time. Ten identifying marks of papal Rome, which succeeded pagan Rome, and which gets bad marks in Scripture. Well, that brings us to the question then. What does a Protestant protest? You go back to the days of the Reformation, and it was the papacy that the Protestants protested. A Protestant is a person who protests the Roman Catholic Church. That's what a Protestant is. Check it out for yourself. That has always been the history and the meaning of a Protestant. And it protests authority on the basis of anything else but God's Word. And, of course, this was the bombshell that Martin Luther threw into the reigning power of his day. Well, at the time of uh, Luther's bombshell, the Catholic Church was shaken to its foundations, as you know. And we had the Counter-Reformation that came in. And during that Counter-Reformation, the Jesuits, began to do a great deal of work to try and come up with interpretations of Bible prophecy that would give another alternative to what Luther had said. It's nothing new that Seventh-day Adventists take the position that the beast and Babylon 
in, in prophecy represent uh, the papacy. Uh, this was part and parcel of Martin Luther's teaching, if you studied it at all. And so the Jesuits came back and uh, did their best to show other interpretations of Bible prophecy, and we still have some of them that are in bold relief today, not the least of which is the futurism and preterism theories that permeate Christendom everywhere today concerning the second coming of Christ. Are you aware of this at all? It came out of the Counter-Reformation and the Jesuit teachings on the prophecy. Well, when you put all of this together, you uh, come up with the, the realization that the United States, in the last half of Revelation 13, which uh, stands up and begins to give allegiance back to Rome again, is going to lead out in a uh, movement that will end in people being forced to receive the mark of the beast in the right hand or their forehead. You also realize, if you read Revelation 13 carefully, that the people who receive the mark of the beast in their right hand or forehead are the ones who do not have their names in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's just that simple. So you have, in the end, two alternatives. To receive the mark of the beast in your right hand or forehead and be lost forever as far as your name in the book of life and salvation, or to receive the seal of God in your forehead only, by the way. That's the only place you can receive the seal of God. And to have your name in the Lamb's book of life and to continue to know salvation and to be ready to, to meet Jesus when he comes. Now, if you read Revelation 12 right on through to Revelation 15 and 16, you discover that the alternatives, both of them, look bad at first glance. If you receive the seal of God, you're going to be threatened to be killed you're not going to be able to buy or sell, and it looks like a dead-end street. If you receive the mark of the beast, you're going to uh, have something called the seven last plagues that you will partake of. The sun will scorch you with heat. You'll gnaw your tongue for pain, and you will be lost at the end of the world forever. It looks like no alternatives, no place to hide. So you have to realize at this point that these issues are big issues. At least they're big issues, aren't they? This isn't something that we treat lightly once over. We should be desperately concerned because some of the most uh, stringent warnings in all the Bible have to do with these two issues. All right? Now, when Jesus comes again, there are only going to be two groups of people. Only two groups. And apparently, as you study through the first parts of Revelation, you discover that these two groups of people come out of three. Revelation 3, the last part, talks about the hot, the cold, and the lukewarm. Apparently, those who are on fire for God, apparently those who couldn't care less, and apparently those in between who are trying to straddle the fence. One foot in heaven, one foot in hell, you know. Hang on to God and the world at the same time. And the evidence is that most people are in that middle group. But when Jesus actually comes back, he brings his rewards with him to give everyone. And there are rewards for only two types, two groups of people. And the rewards are to either have everlasting life or to perish. And the two groups of people are the hot and the cold, the wise and the foolish, the uh, sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, the good and the bad, righteous and the wicked, the people who receive the mark of the beast, and those who have the seal of God. 
a number of ways of labeling them, but only two groups of people when Jesus comes. So apparently, shortly before Jesus comes, the large center group, the lukewarm, the people who are trying to straddle the fence, will disappear. They will disappear and will go either one way or the other. Now, we could talk a long time about that tonight, but I would like to assure you on the basis of study and observation and all kinds of case histories that some of us believe that this polarization is going on rapidly right now. Right now. And if you have your eyes open, you can see it. It makes no difference whether you're sitting in the church, on the church pew, or if you're out in the world. You can no longer stay in the middle. You're going one way or the other fast right now. And that's the greatest single sign that Jesus' coming is right upon us. And the people who go one way or the other are going to end up clearly identified by this factor. Jesus taught it. Matthew 7, Matthew 25. Whether we know God or whether we don't know God. That's the question. Do you know him as your personal friend or do you not know him? Are you on speaking terms with him? Does he get prime time of your day? Or are you too busy being good or doing other things to have a personal one-to-one -one relationship with God? Is prayer meaningful to you or is it not? Is God's word a prize in your hands? Do you value it or is it not? Do you know him or do you not? Those who know him believe in salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Those who don't know him but are still hoping for salvation believe in salvation by works. Right? Because there's no other option. Either you know him and you are in close relationship with him and you have the experience of faith and you'll be saved eternally, or you don't know him, regardless of how good you are, makes no difference. Now, regardless of how long you've been a church member, if you don't know him and have a personal relationship with him, then you believe in salvation by works. There's no other option. And in the end, as you study through these two groups, you discover that those who know him are going to have the seal of God in their foreheads. And those who don't know him are going to end up with the mark of the beast in their forehead or in their hand. Well, you say uh, you have tortured us long enough. Well, why don't you give us the answer as to what the seal of God and the mark of the beast is? I used to have a major professor in the college who loved to teach by uh, twisting our brains all out of shape. Uh, he never gave us any answer. He just kept asking questions. And uh, when we left his class, instead of going to take a nap or to go play in a gymnasium, we rushed to the library as fast as we could to study the rest of the day and find the answers. Well, that's real teaching, you know. That's what a teacher is. A real teacher knows that you don't teach anybody anything. You lead them into an atmosphere where they discover for themselves. That's what a real teacher does. Well, one day I had a friend, a fiery little guy, who couldn't stand it any longer, and he jumped up in the middle of the class session, and he said, Doctor, you have frustrated us long enough. Now give us the answer. But he didn't get the answer. He had to go to the library and find it out for himself. <laughs> Tonight I'm going to try and give you the answer. The seal of God. Let's go to Revelation, the 14th chapter again. This famous chapter that has so much in it. And let's read the first angel's message. Verse 7, verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. That is Ten Commandment language. Did you know that? that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. 
That's Ten Commandment language. Let's go to the middle of the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment that Grandpa Nels read that day. And if you know it, some of you old-timers, go ahead and say it with me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And worship him that made what? Heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Fourth commandment language. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Well, uh, you say, uh, what do you mean by seal? Seal. Well, you go back to the Bible days, you go back to the early days, you go back to the beginning of our country, and you still find it true today. Any seal of any government has three parts to it. It has the name of the ruler. It has the uh, title of that ruler. And it has the territory over which he rules. Right? That's what a seal contains. And the signet ring, way back, all the rest of it. Those are the three elements. So in the beginning of our country, the seal had on it George Washington, the name of the ruler of our country, or the leader of our country. We came from the other country to get away from a ruler, didn't we? All right. The name, the title, president, and the territory over which he ruled, the United States of America. Now, there's only one place in God's law that gives those three things. It's in the fourth commandment. What is his name? For in six days, the Lord, the Lord. What is his title? The Lord made. He is our maker. He's the creator. That's his title, the creator. Made how much? Over what does he rule? Heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. So you find in the middle of the Ten Commandments and in the middle of the Fourth Commandment the seal of God, which leads you to this conclusion that when the, four, when the, the great issues are, are made clear at the very end of this world, it is going to include a call to God's people to accept the seal of God in their foreheads and it's going to include the fourth commandment, the seal of God, and the Sabbath. The seventh-day Sabbath. Now, if we were to follow the logical conclusion, if this beast power has something that you can get in your forehead too, you would expect that it would have something to do with a day of worship as well, right? With a day of worship. Is that so? Go back with me to a one-verse scripture in Daniel, the seventh chapter, verse 25. Daniel 7, 25. Here you have a description of precisely what this beast power would do or try to do. It is a very significant text. Speaking of the papacy that followed pagan Rome, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. There's only one commandment in God's Ten Commandment law that has to do with time. This power would think to change God's laws. 
and his times. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. It's very interesting that in the early days after 1844, when Methodists and Baptists and Lutherans and all the rest of these different faiths were trying to work through the disappointment of 1844, when Christ didn't come as they expected, that uh, some of the Baptist people began to notice something about the Seventh-day Sabbath. And as they studied it, they noticed this text in Daniel 7, 25. And they said, this must have something to do with the prediction in prophecy centuries ago that there would come a power that would try and change God's law and his day of worship. And they continued to study it further and came to the conclusion that this is exactly what had happened. Well, I have brought along tonight uh, something that I could read a great deal from, but I'd like to just remind you of one or two points that came from the Council of Trent. As you know, as a result of the Reformation and Luther and all the Reformers, the Catholic Church finally called a great council that lasted for years, for years. It was the last great council before Vatican I and Vatican II, which you're more familiar with. Now, the great, the great issue that had to be decided at the Council of Trent was this. Does the church base its authority on the Bible, like Luther is pulling for, or does the church use as its authority the traditions of the church, that which was handed down by the church fathers? That was one of the big issues. And the Catholic Church had to decide on that issue. And finally, as the Council of Trent was coming to a close, on December 13, 1545, and on through to the end of the Council, in 1562, the Archbishop of Reggio stood up and made a speech. And in this speech, he openly declared that tradition stood above Scripture for Catholics. And he says, the authority of the church can therefore not be bound to the authority of Scripture. And he gave as his reason this, because the church changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by the command of Christ, but by its own authority. Taken from J. H. Holtzman, Canon and Tradition, page 263. I have a long list of other quotations. I'm going to spare you the time here. But the point is that those who have studied the subject are very much aware that the Catholic Church has made the claim, always has made the claim, that it had the authority to change God's law and his day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. I have at home a collection of 22 reasons that I have had the opportunity of gathering together, 22 reasons that most people who do not worship on Saturday, 22 reasons that they have for keeping Sunday. It's every reason that I've ever heard. And in fact, I would like to share those reasons with you if you have a particular interest in our, one of our guests. But of all of the reasons that are given, such as the disciples took an offering on the first day of the week and so on and so forth, you can read a lot of them. The one that is the best and the one that many Protestant ministers and people have faced and admitted is that they worship on the first day of the week, not because it is in the Bible, but because it was given to them by the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church has used this against Protestants as proof that Protestants 
ought to go ahead and follow along with the rest of Catholic teaching and doctrine. If you accept one thing that the church gave you, they say to Protestants, why don't you accept the rest of it? Why don't you come on back and join us where we were in the first place? It might interest you to know that Melanchthon, Martin Luther's colleague, was very much involved and interested in the Seventh-day Sabbath way back there. But Luther was too busy trying to throw the bombshell into the hierarchy at that time that uh, they must go back to the Bible to make much of it. But Melanchthon, the studious colleague of Luther, was heavy into it himself. And through the centuries that have followed, there have been people here and there in the history of the churches that have taken a special interest and paid special attention to this issue. And at the very end, before Jesus comes, there is a message with three angels flying in the midst of heaven that includes all of this truth back to what God had in mind in the first place. So you are faced then with the question, are we going to accept the seal of God in our forehead or the mark of the beast in our forehead or in our hand? Now, of course, this is symbolic language. And as you look at the symbols of Revelation, you come up with the realization that in our forehead would have to be referring to something that we do intelligently, right? Our thinking, our conscience, our personal inward conviction from the heart, whereas receiving something in our right hand would indicate accepting something simply in terms of action or doing, doing it because of pressure, doing it because everybody else is doing it, going through the motions, the routine, without the intelligent understanding and conscience and conviction and judgment. It's very interesting that the mark of the beast you can receive in either your forehead or your hand, but you can only receive the seal of God in your forehead. It's a very interesting distinction. And anyone who tries to receive the seal of God in simply his hand is not going to receive the seal of God at all. Which, uh, another way of saying it would be, if I think that I'm going to go along with what I was brought up with, if I think that God has grandsons and granddaughters, and that I can slide into heaven and into truth simply on my father or mother's coattail, or Grandpa Nelson's coattail, I'm going to be surprised. Back to the song we had for special music. You have to stand alone. That's the only way you can accept truth. Not because someone else told it to you, but because you have become convicted by your own conscience and your own study. But there will be people, because of the pressure and the popular thing, that will accept the mark of the beast in either their forehead or their hand. They'll go along with the crowd. And if someone yells, Uncle because they're about ready to blow the world to bits, and they say, let's turn to God, where would you expect most of the people to turn? To the most unpopular, the smallest religious group, or the biggest one in the world? Where do you expect that they would turn if they were going to turn back to God? You would expect, according to the way people move, and the thundering herd, to go back to the biggest professed Christian body, wouldn't you? And today we have some of the seeds of the United States, Protestant America, leading out in this, maybe one of the closest, maybe the one of the closest we've come to, is an organization known as the Moral Majority. Have you ever heard of it? I saw a bumper sticker the other day. It said, the Moral Majority is neither. Now, figure that one out. The moral majority is neither moral nor majority. But you already see the seeds of Protestant America going back to Rome when you have an organization that is growing by leaps and bounds, which is determined to force people to force. And any time you find anyone in the history of the world that is going to try and force people and their conscience religiously 
you know that is always of the devil. It is always of the devil. Am I right? Because God never forces anyone. Jesus stands and he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He entreats us, but God never forces us. He has a sacred regard for everyone's power of choice. Well, you say, what difference does it make? What is the Sabbath a sign of? The Sabbath is the birthday of the world. The seventh day Sabbath was given in honor of the Creator. Did you know that the day, every day, has an astronomical reason for its existence. The day is caused by the turning of the earth on its axis. The month has an astronomical reason for its existence. It's the relationship of the earth to the moon, right? And the year has an astronomical reason for its existence. The relationship of the earth to the sun. But the week has no astronomical reason for its existence. The only reason for the week goes back to creation. And if you've studied it carefully for yourself, you have discovered that the weekly cycle has never been broken from the first when God created this earth. And God must have had something to do about that. The weekly cycle has never been broken. They've changed the calendar and it's numbering. But man has never interrupted the weekly cycle. So every seventh day since creation, God evidently has a special purpose for his people to worship him as the creator. And it's good for creatures to worship their creator. It's in honor of the birthday of the world. And no one can change anyone else's birthday. That's impossible. So when you see a power that comes along in history that gets its authority from pagan Rome and tries to change God's law and the commandment that has to do with God's time and law, it doesn't really. But it must be a blasphemous power to think it could change something that God himself can't change. God himself can't change history. God can't rewrite history. History is done. And the history of creation is done. And the seventh day Every week, in honor of the Creator. Well, no wonder God feels deeply about this. And no wonder the devil has been anxious to do away with God's day of worship. If the devil, way back at the beginning, said, I'm going to lift myself up above God, and I'm going to challenge God and His authority, one of the first things the devil would have to do would be to take a long look at God's day of worship in honor of creation, because to be the creator is the biggest thing you can be. If the missionary goes to the sun worshiper in the heathen country, and he walks up to the sun worshiper and says, I'd like to talk to you about the God that made the sun. And the heathen has only one alternative. You mean, you have a God that made the sun? Then he must be bigger than my God. But if you have a God who not only made the sun but who made everything, heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, that would be bigger than any God that man could come up with. Isn't that true? And then you have a day in honor of the Creator. No wonder the enemy has tried to pull a rug out from underneath the whole thing and to change it. When Jesus was here in Matthew, the 12th chapter, and the 8th verse, he made an interesting statement. He said, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Even of the Sabbath. Evidently, the Sabbath to God is one of his prized possessions. You see a wealthy man who walks down the street showing you what he owns, and he says, uh, this condominium is mine. And this high rise belongs to me. And, uh, and this, uh, Cadillac agency is mine. 
And even this ship in the harbor is mine. When he uses the word even, it means right here is my most prized possession. And when Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath, he was trying to say something concerning this is one of his prizes. And his blessing is in it in a special way. And the people who get the victory over the beast and his image and his mark at the end are going to get the victory over self-worship. They're going to get the victory over the idea that they can challenge their creator or change his times and laws. They're going to get the victory over pride and selfishness. They're going to get the victory over their independence. And they're going to stand on a sea that looks like glass someday because they have learned to value the Creator and a day in honor of the Creator. Does it hold together? These are some of the reasons, really very briefly, why Seventh-day Adventists have convictions, convictions in their conscience, their mind, their judgment, intelligent convictions concerning a day of worship. We don't do this just to be different. We don't enjoy being different any more than anyone else enjoys being different for being different's sake. But we are convicted that this is truth. And it all shows up in the prophecies. And in the end, when you have a threat that comes that those who do not go along and worship the beast in his image and receive his mark are going to be killed. And they are threatened that they won't be able to buy or sell. There will be a boycott on them. And it looks like no place to go. There is a place to go. It's in your Bible where God says, I have been old and now I am I have been young, now I am old, through the prophet of old. And yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. Bread shall be given, and their water shall be sure. When it comes to the concern about the last issues at the end of the world, there are some beautiful psalms. We used to quote one when I was a boy around the family worship circle. And it's still a favorite. Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For He shall give His angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. The Bible is full of promises for God's people who love Him. You know that, don't you? And when it comes to going the other direction and receiving the beast in His image and His mark, there's only one alternative, to not have your name in the book of life and to be among those who are not ready when Jesus comes and who cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of Him that sitteth upon the throne. I hope that you've gotten a little glimpse this evening of how God feels about these issues. I feel like I'm just getting started, and I'm sorry. I trust that my father covered all the rest of the bases last night, and someone told me he talked only 40 minutes, and I've gone past that a long time ago. But there, if there are guests here tonight that find this new, I have something personal I want to make sure that you get. I'd like to have you get in your hands these 22 reasons for keeping Sunday that people use. I'd like to help you to understand this because we are desperately concerned to share it. And so if you would simply let us know who you are, we have, uh, I think, in the 
of pews tonight on the on the back of the seats, you'll see a little card like this. And uh, this uh, sort of a green card. Is it obvious there? And on the back of this card, you can let us know if you would like to find out further information on this subject, because we've had so much to cover in such a little time. We also have on the front of this card some different options concerning decisions that you might like to make as you've listened to these meetings. And really, I think that we'd be doing you a disfavor if we didn't give you an opportunity to, in some tangible way, indicate what you're doing about what you've heard. And so on the front of this card called My Decision, there are several boxes you can check. There's one for most anybody here, but particularly for guests who have found this new. Won't you indicate what you'd like to do? And on the back, write us a note. If you have something you'd like to share in terms of questions or a desire to have further studies on these subjects. And then if you'd put your name and address there, then we can be sure and have you receive some of the extra material on this that we'd like to put in your hands. So if you do that, and then as you go out this evening, simply put this little green card on the tables with the other coupons that you have, and we'll receive them in that way. In the meantime, I urge you, in the name of Jesus, I urge you to think carefully concerning the issue of being on God's side at the very end. Isn't it a privilege to be able to stand up and be counted for truth and for what God has revealed in these days? You have been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International Copyright American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. To order CDs or audio cassettes of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 1-800-233-4450. International calls, please dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. There you will discover the largest selection of genuine Adventist preaching available. American Cassette Ministries is not a one-man band. It's an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Cassette Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. Our email address is info at americancassette.org. We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and financial support are important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.